you know, in your, uh, in iConnect, I, I've seen that you spoke with one of our prior guests, Blake Moore. Um, obviously you yeah. have been active in, uh, speaking with some industry advocates. Um, you know, I've done that myself and I try to keep our viewers apprised of what's going on in this area. So maybe if you could uh, speak on some of those points, that would be great. Yes, most definitely. Um, so I'll speak more um, to the PCB industry, but um, as you know, a trending hashtag that propagated across the internet and the PCB community a few years ago was the hashtag uh, chips don't float. Uh, right. And, and essentially that means that we can't just invest money into the semiconductor chips, but we have to invest money into the entire ecosystem. And that means um, that includes the packaging and the, the PCB itself. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Priya Kure, material scientist with AGC Multimaterials. This is a company I have not had a chance to learn about just yet, and so I'm very excited to talk to Priya today. Priya, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat to you a little bit about the company and what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I first became aware of you through iConnect. And yes. so I, I occasionally like to have folks from iConnect come on here and, and talk about themselves and what they do. So maybe if you could just give us an overview of how you got started in the electronics industry and um, how did you come to work in the materials area? Definitely. Um, so it happened kind of accidentally. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was at Rutgers University and uh, I was figuring out what I wanted to study. So one day I found myself at an engineering research fair and I was going through all of the different sections and I saw research projects from the electrical engineering department and the mechanical engineering department. And I stumbled into the material science and engineering department. And as a young college freshman, I was so enamored and enchanted with all of the different things you can do as a material scientist. And um, today, a lot of people don't know exactly what material science is. Uh, it's essentially looking at how the chemical structure of a material or how the atoms are oriented in space, how does that impact properties like dielectric constant and dissipation factor? How can we smartly combine two or three or four different materials to get a resin flow that we want or a copper peel strength that we want? And so, um, you know, material science is, is looking at the chemical structure of a material and making very smart uh, decisions on how to combine different materials to make a tangible product. And I thought that there was so much creativity and innovation in that. So um, in 2020, I finished my PhD in material science engineering from Penn State. And for the last three years, I have been working at AGC Multimaterial as a material scientist. And I get to, um, I, I get to do formulation work and help push forward product development on our products, such as uh, build-up films for uh, chip packaging and HDI applications. You know, I worked on materials a bit myself when I was working on my PhD research, and it was something oh. I never, I never thought I would get into until I started doing it. I was working with optics, but okay. I, I, okay. I, it became enamored with it as well, especially once I started looking to, into the literature. So I, I can relate to that. Yeah, and and it's so as you know, right? It's so interdisciplinary. Once you have that knowledge base, you can apply it to projects in mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think at at some point when you're doing research on certain classes of materials, you start having light bulbs go off in your head around certain envisioned applications, even if they are kind of crazy and out there. You just start having those eureka moments. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those are always fun. So um, if you could tell us more about uh, AGC Multimaterial. Yes. Um, so AGC uh, stands for Asahi Glass Company. And it was founded in 1907 as Japan's first glass manufacturer, uh, which I thought was super interesting. And so over the past 110 years of its history as a company, it has evolved to have divisions in glass, electronics, chemicals, ceramics, 
Um, and, and today, many of the materials and chemical businesses within AGC fall under uh, top global shares. And so uh, my company, AGC Multimaterial, falls under AGC Electronics Company. And uh, the birth of Multimaterial happened in 2018 and 2019 with the acquisition of Nelco and Taconic. And so, um, as you know, Nelco has historically pushed forward innovation on creating low-loss copper-clad laminates, uh, whereas Taconic has uh, done a lot of great work with RF materials and creating build-up films for HDI, ultra-HDI, military, and so the acquisition of these two companies and therefore the birth of AGC Multimaterial, it came from a place of wanting to bring together two champions in the PCB industry with the goal of co-designing materials for PCB substrates and uh, chip packaging together. You know, you, you brought up two classes of materials here. One of them was uh, low loss copper clad laminates. The other was yeah. RF materials. And I think when most people think about those materials, they're probably not thinking AGC multi-material. Are you guys trying yeah. to, to grow through acquisition and, and really compete with someone like a Rogers? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Um, and I think brand awareness is a, is a huge part of that, you know, just making, because AGC in Japan, it is, it is one of the largest companies in Japan. Everybody Everybody knows AGC, the light bulbs go off. Um, so we're definitely trying to get that level of recognition uh, here in the States because it is such a huge global company. Sure, sure. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit more, what types of materials does AGC produce? Yes, for sure. So um, like I mentioned, AGC acquired Taconic in 2019. And the acquisition of Taconic has really set AGC Multimaterial up for success with developing build-up films for HDI and Ultra HDI, as well as investigating these build-up films for um, chip packaging applications. So one of our flagship products in which all of our build-up film development is centered around is a product called the FastRise TC. And the FastRise TC is a non-reinforced uh, polymer composite buildup film. Non-reinforced meaning that it's not reinforced with a traditional uh, glass, uh, glass cross. It's simply reinforced with filler material. And what is especially interesting about the Fast Rise TC is that it has excellent thermal reliability. Uh, and so just to put it into context a little bit, 24 test coupons were made with the Fast Rise TC and they went through 200 thermal cycles from room temperature to 260 degrees C without a single failure. And what's so interesting about that from a material science perspective, if you think about it, is because um, the Fast Rise TC was designed very smartly to match the CTE of copper. So um, CTE, of course, is the coefficient of thermal expansion. It's the amount that a material physically expands and contracts under the application of heat. Copper has a, a, a CTE of 18 parts per million over degree C. Fast rise TC matches that. And because you have these two materials in your stack up expanding and contracting at the same rate, it leads to a material with incredible thermal reliability, um, suitable for military and ultra HDI applications. And so um, as, as a material scientist at AGC, some of the work that I've done is help push forward uh, the innovation on making a low DK version of our fast rise product. Um, and so low DK is important, as you know, because for a given trace width, if you have a lower DK material, you can reduce the thickness. And this is so paramount for applications, um, you know, that need miniaturization, uh, like HDI and ultra HDI. And so for this low DK project, we were able to achieve a buildup film with a dielectric constant of 2.1 to 2.2 by using a special filler material. Um, the formulation work for this product is still ongoing and we're working to optimize other material properties uh, for this project and product. So how do uh, some of the AGC multi-material products compare to other materials in this space? Yeah, um, 
That's a great question. So, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, Taconic's history has been basically pushing forward the product development on RF materials and, and low loss buildup films. And um, when we acquired Nelco, you know, their history was uh, innovating low loss copper clad laminates. AGC is a huge chemicals and, and materials company. And so multi-material benefits from having the, the know-how of these two icons in the PCB industry with the sheer raw material and chemical technologies that AGC Group, the parent company, has. And so uh, right now we're, we're strongly collaborating with AGC Research Center in Japan, um, where about 1,500 people are doing R&D research on advanced materials within this world-class characterization lab. And so, you know, to answer your question, I think what differentiates us from our competitors is the synergy between bringing together these two icons in the PCB industry with the raw material and chemical capability that AGC um, group as a whole has, uh, as well as co-designing PCB and chip packaging materials um, for for both spaces. When you say co-designing, to me that says you're really designing one material set that could be used in either application if needed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so with, with that in mind, um, it sounds like you're trying to take advantage of the projected growth in the chip packaging, HDI substrate, or UHDI, and then you know chip substrates market. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I I think um, because so many designers out there, uh, especially you know PCB designers who may have a lot of experience with different kinds of materials, they start to hear packaging, and I think for some of them, they haven't worked in the semiconductor industry. They're really not familiar with the materials and how similar or different they may be compared to PCB materials. So um, could you give us an overview of packaging materials? Um, and for example, what is the current standard for packaging technology and where is it heading? Right, right, for sure. Um, so chip packaging refers to the organic dielectric layer that routes the semiconductor chip to the printed circuit board. And so um, chip packaging materials, typically they consist of an organic layer, an or organic core that's sandwiched between subsequent layers of buildup film. So um, because cores are usually organic materials, they can suffer from high warpage and um, they can suffer from high warpage and low modulus from their polymeric components. Uh, and so one material that has been identified as a next generation alternative to the organic core is glass. So glass has a high modulus and a low CTE compared to polymer materials. Uh, and because of that, those characteristics are ideal for preventing warpage of the chip package. So this is not something uh, I'm working on, but AGC headquarters in Japan is actively working on developing a glass to be suitable to be used as a core in uh, chip packaging applications. And at AGC Multimaterial, right now we're investigating the use of our buildup film technology to be applied to, you know, chip packaging buildup films, uh, as well as understanding how the mechanism between the buildup film adheres to um, something like a glass core. Uh, maybe if you could, uh, just tell us a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about the warpage problem. Um, so you brought up warpage. Um, does this just place excess stress on the die whenever warpage happens? And then what are some of the main causes of warpage of these materials in a package? Yeah, um, so warpage does cause excess strain on the die and it it prevents going into uh, higher gigabytes per second technology because you want it to be as reliable and flat as possible, right? And it comes back down to um, it comes back down to CTE. Glass inherently has a lower CTE than organic polymeric materials do. And so um, you can there are certain products on the market right now where you can achieve a low um, a low CTE and therefore likely low warpage with um, with polymers but as a whole by and large because glass is um, has a how to say a higher modulus and a lower CTE that's why it's been identified as kind of a next generation material to prevent this issue in chip packaging 
So I, I have to ask, what is special about the glass that you want to create? I, I mean, I think most people may not realize that glasses are a very broad class of materials beyond just, you know, the windows that you look through to see outside. So what's, what's yeah. special about the glass that you want to use in packaging? Special about the glass that we want to use in the packaging is that it's going to come from AGC and AGC <laughs> is like the glass company in the world. <laughs> I, I understand. Um, can't can't reveal yeah. the secret sauce, so that's fair. Yeah, yeah. It, wish I could. I, the real scientist in me wants to divulge all the science. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so may, maybe let's move on just briefly. Um, so how has the growth in the packaging materials demand changed since the passage of the Chips Act? Um, one reason I ask is because you know in your uh, in iConnect, I, I've seen that you spoke with one of our prior guests, Blake Moore. Um, obviously, you yeah. have been active in uh, speaking with some industry advocates. Um, you know, I've done that myself, and I try to keep our viewers apprised of what's going on in this area. So maybe if you could uh, speak on some of those points, that would be great. Yes, most definitely. Um, so I'll speak more um, to the PCB industry, but um, as you know, a trending hashtag that propagated across the internet and the PCB community a few years ago was the hashtag uh, chips don't flow. Uh, right. And, and essentially that means that we can't just invest money into the semiconductor chips, but, we have to invest money into the entire ecosystem. And that means um, that includes the packaging and the, the PCB itself, right? And so, uh, like you mentioned last year, I got the chance to speak to Congressman Blake Moore. He, alongside uh, Anna, Congresswoman Anna Shu, they introduced the Protecting Printed Circuit Boards Act to US Congress in May of 2023. And um, this act, if passed, it's, it would provide a 25% tax credit for the purchase or acquisition of American-made PCBs. Um, it would also establish a financial assistance program modeled after CHIPS that would um, that would give funding for the, f the building of um, manufacturing and research and development for PCB facilities. And it would give $3 billion to carry out this program if passed. And so I think because of the advent and the passing of the CHIPS Act, there's a lot more awareness for other parts of the ecosystem that have uh, been kind of neglected within the past couple of years. So, you know, the industry has done a great job propagating for PCB. Congress realizes the importance of supporting PCBs. And I think that they know it's not just a matter of investing in the latest technology, but it's also a matter of investing in our national security and, and economy. So in, in terms of the uh, financial assistance program that's modeled after the CHIPS Act, um, yeah. I think the perception is that this only goes for manufacturing facilities. Is that correct? Or does it go towards really anything else that might positively impact the supply chain? PCBs, yeah. Um, I think it is primarily for manufacturing, but if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it also includes investing in um, the research and development of PCBs kind of just holistically putting in resources to make sure that our PCB supply chain is uh, resilient and, and robust. So another, I guess, related question to this, because the whole goal of all of this is, I guess, really to shift the, uh, the geographic distribution of the supply chain so that it's a little more evenly distributed and yeah. thereby make us less susceptible to geopolitical problems, natural disasters, list goes on and on. So right. have you, or has uh, AGC Taconics seen any of the demand start to shift geographically? Are you seeing more demand outside of Taiwan and China and maybe more demand in, let's say, Europe and the U.S.? I think so, because uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where AGC Multimaterial you know, is located, is becoming the, it's colloquially called the Silicon Desert, you know, it, <laughs> so many companies are coming to Phoenix, Arizona. So I really do think that this is becoming the next manufacturing and research and development hotspot, not only for PCB, but for chip packaging and chips itself. Yeah, it's really interesting to see all of this kind of take place. And I, I have to be honest, I was a little skeptical at the level of support that people were going to uh, uh, put put forward towards 
trying to reshore some of PCB production. But, you know, initially it, it's looking promising. I mean, you have American Standard Circuits who came out talking about their UHDI and Calumet is involved. Um, in fact, Meredith LeBeau is working, I think, on the NIST panel for implementation of some of these funds. So I'm, I got to say, I'm, I'm impressed at the number of people who have really taken this seriously. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was I was in Washington, D.C., and it's very encouraging to see there are so many moving parts from so many different federal departments working towards this one goal of, you know, bolstering our supply chain in, in semiconductor in America from from Department of Energy to Department of Defense to Department of Commerce. So um, it's very it's it's very hopeful, I think. So g given that you, you've you spent more time in Washington, D.C. dealing with this kind of stuff than I have, um, <laughs> I haven't done it at all. Um, I've been invited by the, the PCBAA guys, but I haven't I haven't been yet, so I would love to go this year. Um, David Schild, if you're listening, email me. But um, <laughs> I, I, I've always wondered, you know, what do you, what do you folks on the Hill, uh, how, how do they react when someone comes up and talks to them about this? What's their perception about PCBs and the supply chain that's associated with them when you start talking about, uh, you know, things like applying the CHIPS Act model to supporting the onshoring or nearshoring of PCB production? Do they do they even realize that PCBs are an important thing? Or do, Definitely. do, do you have to, like, yeah. really break it down for them? No, not at all. They, they, they know how important it is. So when I spoke to Blake Moore last year... Um, during our uh, I-007 interview, it was so um, apparent that, like, he, he said, Congress is a funny place, right? And there are so many issues circulating, not just in technology sector, but in the health sector and the infrastructure sector. But everybody knows the importance of PC. They know that this is an issue. And I think something that is um, extremely and compelling is the fact that the Protecting Printed Circuit Boards Act, it's bipartisan legislature, right? And so you kind of see across the board, uh, it's gotten support, it hasn't passed yet, but you know, they're doing their best. And it's clear to me being in, in DC and, and speaking to various people that they know that this is an important issue, you know, and, and that's, that's what makes it um, quite hopeful, I think, as, as a scientist, seeing that these very real issues that you and I deal with on a, on a lab level are, you know, being taken, taken very seriously. It, I, I, I'm encouraged too. I, I'm just hoping that the, uh, the level of growth expands beyond just defense because for so, for so long, you know, the only support has really come from NDAAs, right? And it's really, meant to support, you know, military PCB production, which, you know, that's part of the supply chain. And it's, it's important because it helps keep a lot of the mom and pop shops afloat and all of that. Um, but most PCBs are not, you know, defense, they're consumer products and all of that, yeah. you know, so much of it happens in Taiwan, Vietnam, China, you know, it's, it's expanding out. I think people are taking, you know, a China plus one strategy pretty seriously. Um, still most of that production is not north america and it's not not latin america yeah yeah um no uh, not, that's a that's a great point too i i think the pcbaa is doing excellent work lobbying for these efforts and you know i would say that um corresponding with them and uh, presenting these thoughts to the decision makers is is the best way forward yeah, I would agree with you. Um, so getting off of uh, politics for just a moment. Um, so what, what, some, what are some of the plans uh, that AGC has in the future for future products? Um, I know you mentioned glass for uh, chip packaging. Um, we kind of talked briefly about low DK. Um, I know you wouldn't admit to it, but I'm hoping there's a sub 2 DK material coming out. Um, what, what else is AGC planning uh, as far as in the material space uh, to support the industry? I think what I can um, mention and what I can talk about, um, given my background in the formulation development, is uh, certainly expanding on our build-up film 
build up film business and like you said uh developing uh these build up films with different dk's whether they're low 2.1 to 2.2 dk's or to uh to a higher space and our our agc headquarters in japan is certainly doing great work with investigating the use of glass as a core material so i don't know if i can divulge more beyond that but um I can I can guarantee it'll be it'll be very compelling and good science. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. You know, as some of this stuff comes out and as all these things we talked about continue to develop, we'd love to have you come back on and talk about some of this stuff. I'd love to. I'd love to. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. To everyone that's listening, we've been talking with Priya Kure, material scientist with AGC Multimaterials. I should say Dr. Priya Kure. I apologize earlier. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave us a comment. You'll be able to keep up with all of our tutorials and podcast episodes as they come out. And last but not least, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.